Hello and welcome to Organ Showcase. As you've already gathered from this week's introductory music, we've got a special showcase for you today. And if the music alone didn't provide sufficient clues for you to guess who I'm talking to, I'm sure that if I tell you that I'm in the Tower Ballroom Blackpool right now with our guest, then you'll know that it's Ernest Broadbent. And it's a great pleasure to have you in the Tower Ballroom this evening. Thank you most kindly. And first of all, before we start to talk about the Tower, Ernest, I would like to really go back in time and talk about your the early part of your life. I always thought you were born in Yorkshire, but I understand, in actual fact, you were born in Lancashire, and it was the town of Oldham. It was quite correct. I was born in Oldham, but at the age of three, I went to live with my grandma in Leeds, uh, the reason being my father was killed in the war. And you studied piano and musical theory at the College of Music there? Yes, I did. They were tough times, Ernest. They were tough times for me and probably tough times for you. They certainly were, Eric. I had no money. My grandma used to give me tuppence a week. And I used to go from a lesson three times a week. And I had to walk to Leeds, which was five miles, and walk back, wet or fine, snow or rain or anything. Yes, I remember going for a piano lesson and the teacher saying to me, well, you always late for your piano lesson. You're missing some of your lesson. I didn't like to say to the man, well, I can't afford the tram fare. I had to walk it. And this was all part of the scene at that time. It certainly was. But nevertheless, you went along and you progressed so, so well at the Leeds College that you even won the Marcus of Norm Normandy Prize for piano and theory. What happened after that, Ernest? What, how did you come to get involved in the theatre organ? Well, when I left school, my mother went out to work and paid for my lessons to continue until I was 16 because the uh, college at that time wanted me to be a concert pianist and my mother couldn't just afford to, for me to carry on. So when I was 16 I decided I would earn some money for my mother and I went playing in the silent films. I went from one cinema to the other until the talkies came. And uh, at the same time I was very friendly with some organ builders, Vince Fitton and Haley of Bramley Leeds and they suggested that I should, being an organist already, playing at church, that I should take this position at the new cinema Ilkley, following Henry Crouchton, which I did, and I stayed there for four years. You stayed in Yorkshire quite some time and then, of course, you went down to London. I did. I went from Ilkley, I went down to the Dominion Theatre to work for Government British. And I worked with Frederick Bacon and uh, from, from the Dominion I used to go out to the New Gallery and Relieve, uh, the New Victoria, the Astoria. Who were the personalities that you were The personalities then? that I met in London were Frederick Bacon, uh, Florence de Jong, uh, Frederick Curzon, who was a great friend of mine, he was a great composer too, and uh, I've got all his music signed by Frederick, and we were great pals in those days. Yes, well, many of the listeners will recall those names, particularly Frederick Curzon as a, oh, yes. a, 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 a composer of good British light orchestral music, and of course, Freddie Bacon finally finished up as a, a, a producer for the BBC. He did, yes. 
And I understand that quite recently, Florence de Young, is she playing for silent pictures in London she or something? Is. Um, I think it's the National Film Theatre or something like that. She's doing very well, is Florence. She's a great personality, by the way. Well, leaving uh, uh, Florence de Young and London, uh, we take you to the seaside for the first time, and that was Brighton. That's right. Well, what happened, Eric, I can tell you, I didn't care for London at all. Although I like Frederick Curzon and all the organists, but I didn't settle in London at all. And I asked for a move. And they sent me, first of all, to Bromley Gormont, which I didn't like there. And then they sent me down to Brighton, where I really stayed for 16 years. And I thoroughly enjoyed myself down there. And what sort of music were you playing at Brighton? Because I would have thought this was not quite like Blackpool at that time. Well, I did the, uh, I did organ interludes in, in the region Brighton. And then upstairs, of course, there was a dance hall. And I used to do 20 minutes a night, relieve the orchestra on a Hammond. So you were well schooled in playing for dancing long before you came to Blackpool? Yeah, that's quite correct, yes. But it was more of a lighter orchest orchestral type of music that was played in the theatres at that it time, was, wasn't yeah, it? was, very, yes, very, very light orchestral music. And in that particular field, if I may say so, I think uh, that you really shine above most Good. people in this country today. And after all, I think it is the light orchestral uh, registration of the theatre organ that sets it apart from other types of organs. I think you're quite correct. Now the stage and uh, uh, music on the stage, of course, is nothing new to you. You're yeah. probably one of the most experienced accompanists of a top flight stage star. And that was Joseph Locke. Yes. Well, what happened really, when I was at the Regent Brighton after the war, um, of course, I was about the last organist to play in the suburbs, in a cinema. And eventually I got the usual letter that, would I like to be a manager? And I said, no, I can play and I'm going to play. So I went to London and saw Lawrence Wright. I knew him quite well because he'd been down to Brighton quite a lot. And he said, I can fix you up for a summer season on the North Pier. So I said, all right, I'll do that. So I did that, and during the summer I met Joseph Locke. And um, he heard me play, and he said, would I like to do a concert tour with him? So I thought, well, I might as well. So I did this concert tour, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And then we did all the theatres in the country. You know, we did a... a a variety tour too. And of course you would be living a life amongst other stars. I did, I, I met nearly all the stars in those days. How did you like the theatrical life? Because I that's totally a sort enjoyed of a Rolling it. Stone life, isn't it? No, I enjoyed it. Because what Joseph used to do, he used to live at St Anne's, I lived in Blackpool then, and um, we used to do a fortnight and come home for a week. So it was not too bad. How did you get along with an artist at that time, quite so famous as well, Joseph Locke. Everybody knew Joseph in those days, and we were the extremes. I was the quiet type, he was the, uh, you know, the character type. But we got him very well. He thought the world of me. I could do my job, and he'd, he'd no worries about. Mm -hmm. 
music or anything. Hear my song, Violetta. Hear my song beneath the moon. Come to me. Of course, Joseph Locke wasn't the only uh, star that I played for. Going back to Brighton, uh, I used to have Sunday off, and there's a very fine symphony orchestra over at uh, Worthing. And um, they couldn't get a really good accompanist, so uh, I was asked to go along. And I did play for such stars as Hedel Nash, Joan Hammond, Frank Titterton, and a lot of artists of that era. And at the same time, I had about three con piano concertos at my fingertips, and I also did the, uh, at Worthing with the Symphony Orchestra, the Tchaikovsky uh, Piano Concerto in B-flat minor, the Grieg Concerto in A minor, and the Mendelssohn Concerto in G minor. Did you think at this stage of your life, Ernest, that uh, it was, a, uh, uh, was, was there still an opportunity to go concert pianist, or did you think it was too late to bother about? Well, I would have liked to have done, but... Um, of course, if you're going to be a concert pianist, right, you've got to s stay at it and peg at it. But I had to work for my living too, and you just can't do that. And you need like, a lot of money. Yes, I'd like you to ask you the question uh, that uh, most people ask me and probably every other organist, but you, having studied the piano to a, a, a high degree, uh, and really as far as I'm concerned, you still are a master at the piano keyboard, Going over to the organ, does it affect your technique on the piano, or vice versa? No, Eric. The reason being, I think, that I'd, I still do my little bit of piano practice and keep it up. And um, I think if you do a little bit of both, I don't think it affects you at all. No. So you I would don't advise so. people, if they can, and can still afford to keep the, the old piano in If the... they can keep the piano going, I think it's a very fine thing. Of course, around 1952, you decided to finish with the travelling about with the theatre and celebrities like Joseph Locke, and you joined the Tower Company. Quite correct, Eric. The reason being, when I was with Joseph Locke, um, the television had started and uh, theatres were getting rather, the audience was getting rather thin, and Joseph said to me, look, he said, I think it's time you looked after yourself and got out of this. So I joined the Tower Company, and... Um, I played at all the theatres in the Tower Company, the Grand Theatre, the Winter Gardens, the Opera House, the Palace in those days, 
orchestrally and solo. Yes, but being a craftsman, you could fit into any I little fitted, niche. I adapted you? myself to anything. What made you decide to take the organ side? Because up to this time, you've been playing piano. I had, yeah. Did well, you have this? Was it pre-planned, this? Did you say no. to yourself, eventually, I'm going over to the organ side of the no, tower company? No, I settled down as a pianist. But in those days, I played in the tower lounge with a trio. And then it, the Hammond organ came on the scene. So the tower company decided they were to have a Hammond organ in the tower lounge. And I was the person to play it. So, once again, I got to grips with the organ. And it was very successful. And then Horace Finch had an accident in the Empress Ballroom and um, they were short of an organist, so I used to go dabble on the well that's up there, and event eventually I began deputising for Horace Finch, Watson Holmes, and eventually Reginald Dixon. You must have been one of the handiest musicians that uh, the Tower Company have ever employed. Well, I'm probably you're right, Eric, because I've played for all the, um, what, Labour conferences, Conservative conference, Rotary conferences, a Lord Mayor's Banquet, well, the Mayor's Banquets, not the Lord Mayor, the Mayor's Banquets, uh, any, anything special, I'm always called upon. And, of course, you're equally skilled to sit in the pit with an orchestra, True. equally uh, skilled to uh, play the electronic organ. And speak of electronic organs, Ernest, what is your opinion of them in this day and age? Well, I like them, but you, you, can't, you can't compare them with the pipe organ. No, you of just course can't you can't compare them. But one or two of them I rather like. But it does, uh, uh, do you think it, it's made this new audience that you have today? Do you think it's helped to make that audience? Because I certainly do. When I was playing the cinema organ at the same time as you in that period, the fans were few and far between to what they are today. Well, now, this last year at the Tower, Eric, I'll give you, give you an instance. I think we've had all the organ societies in the country here. Uh, we had the Nottingham Organ Society about a fortnight ago about 80 strong came to Blackpool uh, the week after, I'm only going back to the last three weeks, the week after we had the Macclesfield Organ Society and this f this coming Sunday we had the um, Malvern Organ Society coming. And this has been going right through the summer. Yes, but isn't this rather a, a strange thing that when the organ was uh, being uh, played at, at every super theatre on every street corner, more or less throughout the country, the fans weren't around weren't in those there. days. No, they didn't. Now care. they're obsolete, and there's only yourself and maybe one in London playing. They come from all over the country to hear you. Eric, there's a great interest again in the theatre organ. Yes, but has this interest been fanned by the advent of the electronic organ and the I fact they can own one and play it at home. I think it is so. I know these societies come and they think, just sit on, on the tower organ. Just sit on it. That's made their day. It's really made their day, Eric. So there's a great interest again. <laughs>
you've made records on this wonderful organ at the tower, uh, but you've also played the one that is now in the BBC Playhouse at Manchester and referred to as the BBC Theatre Organ as a sister organ. Which of the two organs do you prefer? Because you played the, ta the one in the Winter Gardens, which is now the BBC Organ, as I just said, and now, of course, you're playing the sister organ in the Tower. Yeah. Well, that's rather difficult, I, I was very fond of the Empress Organ. The sound was absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. But to play it, it was a brute to play in it. The, the tibia sounds were absolutely gorgeous. But to play for dancing there, oh, it was hard work. Huh? It was really hard work. Uh, there was a big horseshoe over the console, and the sound used to go right to the other side of the ballroom and come back to you. And it was very difficult to play. If you're playing by yourself or playing anything orchestral, it was delightful. But to play for dancing, it was most difficult. How Horace Finch got on all those years, I don't know. Now it's in its new home, do you find any difference in the organ? Do you find the same? Do you hear the same sounds when you play it? No, I've, I've been over to Manchester on several occasions. I don't like it at all. Right? It's not it the same. Isn't organ. The, not the same at all. Not the same organ. No. Now coming back to this organ here, uh, this is really the third organ that's been installed in this uh, it is, building, yes. isn't it? I, I've just been saying that I like the Empress and I like I like the Tower, but now I'm at the Tower. There's nothing like the Tower organ. It is the finest well, it's the, I think, in the world. It is a three manual instrument, 14 ranks. Um, the two chambers are situated uh, at the top of the ballroom proscenium. And, um, well, all I can tell you, the sound is just fantastic. It rolls around the building. There was a time many years ago when the original organ, the fact that it was rebuilt, and enlarge was not big enough to fill this huge ballroom. Now right. today, does it do the job? It does do the job very, very well. And the beauty of it is, Eric, we've got two stops on there, a quint and a tears, which are, are rather piercing sounds, but when the building is full, you can always get through and you can get a melody through. Now, I know that the average listener won't know what we're talking about. No, they won't, no. But we do know that this quint sound is peculiar certainly at the moment, to this organ at Blackpool. It is. And every time you and I hear this sound, we automatically We, we all know it's the, the tower ballroom the tower. Blackpool. Well, the point is, Eric, when the building is full, you've got to use this to, to get it over. Yes. You can't use it all the time, but um, it's rather difficult to explain. Um, say you're playing a, a, a quick step, and you don't feel the melody's predominant, you can put the quint or tears down, and you, you know that melody is going to sing around the ballroom. In other words, it would be like playing a fifth on the piano, which would cut through on the treble in the exactly. old palladie dance days. Quite true.
Now, what about this uh, uh, musical show that uh, you wrote the music for? Is it called Pip? Yes, that's quite correct. Well, I had a colleague in Blackpool, and he had this idea of doing a musical adapted from Great Expectations, and he decided to call it Pip. So he came to me and he said, look, can you help me? I've got one or two little tunes in my head, and can we put them down on paper? This started about eight years ago. And so throughout the years we kept doing things, and I kept altering music and thinking of tunes and incidental music, and eventually the thing was completed. So um, nothing was done for a year or two, and then the Thornton and Cleveland Light Opera Attic Society, they decided they would like to do something new, and they heard about Pip, and auditions were arranged, uh, practices started, and it was produced at the Winter Gardens last November in Blackpool. And it was a great success. Did you do the orchestration? I did all the orchestrations, yes. And also the conducting of the... No, I didn't conduct. I got a Hammond in the pit. We had an orchestra of 14, and uh, with doing the music and knowing it so well, I had a week's holiday, and I played in the pit because I knew what, what should be. And what sort of success have you had with this show? Well, we're very delighted about it, really. We have six societies who are, who are going to produce this show, and, and one of the... Uh, best ones really is down at Chelmsford where they're going to do that in their festival fortnight. What is your most happy moment since you've been the Tower Ballroom Blackpool organist? Well, I make it all happy. I, 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 I've got to like the job. What I do like about it is the interest people are having coming to Blackpool and wanting to see the Tower organ. And um, it's very gratifying to know that, say, people come on holiday and they ask me, they probably send me a letter, could we see the consul? So I said, with pleasure, it's a great pleasure, it doesn't take long. Show them the consul, and they're so happy that they've seen it, and that's made their holiday. And that gives me lots of pleasure, I 